Nestled on the banks of the Blackwater lies St. Mary's Abbey, Glencairn, County Waterford. Here, a diverse community of women have left their lives as banker, nurse or social worker to create a powerhouse of prayer. A radical life of being rather than doing. A Cistercian monastery is a school of mutual love devoted to the search for God. The austere life of silence, work and prayer may seem a retreat from modern life to some, but the nuns believe that their greatest contribution to the world is through praying in community seven times a day and living a monastic life that has changed little in over a thousand years. We're actually on the lands which were originally part of the monastic lands of the 6th up to the 12th century. So we're on sacred ground. We do live in a very mobile culture. People are constantly moving from here to there, and so this would be countercultural to stay in the one place all of one's life. It's more monotonous, maybe, but I think you do need a certain monotony for prayer because you have to go deeper. And so the life itself brings you deeper. A reading from the rule of our Holy Father, St. Benedict. To put God's commandments into practice every day. To love chastity. To hate no one. Not to be jealous. Not to act from envy. Not to love quarrelling. St. Benedict knows that if we are to practice any skill or craft, we need tools. And this is so with the spiritual craft. We need tools. And these tools are interior. I was working in IT. I started to become kind of disillusioned with the consumerism and with that type of work where you're not really doing anything for anybody apart from making money. So that I remember standing in the busy streets, particularly at Christmas, and thinking, we're all insane, like, this is insanity, all this, you know, working really hard to earn loads of money so we can buy loads of things that we don't need. And it's just like a vicious cycle and it doesn't really make you happy. I began to do a lot of meditation. I had this urge to stay in the one place, to have a very simple life and to pray all the time. And I didn't really know why. I just knew that that's what I wanted, but I just, I didn't know why. We love the place. We have a natural enclosure here. The avenue is a kilometre in length and the river borders the other side. And so there's a natural uh, quietness about the place.
the Foundation Sisters came here on the 10th of March, 1932. They were wonderful women because the life then was dreadfully hard. It was really strict and their poverty was extreme. There was very little furniture and um, very little food, very little anything, you know. <laughs> when I came here first, there was a very strict enclosure and we had chicken wire all around the place with barbed wire on top and nobody could go down to the river and we couldn't go down to the stream behind the place. And I used to look through the chicken wire and I could see the remains of a path and could hear the sound of water. And it was tough, you know, you couldn't go down. We can go down to the river now and we go down to the stream. So the woods are open to us, which is a great blessing. It brings us in contact with God. You know, the, the nature is wonderful. Silence is the thing that our society is so afraid of. If you ever notice, even in a group, if conversation stops, even for 30 seconds, somebody has to rush in there and fill it. We can't bear it. There's this frenetic thing going on all the time with noise. And it's like we're just not comfortable in ourselves. Yeah? And the tragedy of that is that it blocks out that so small voice of God. And what a great deal of our life here about in the silence is trying to listen for that voice. And you can't do that with it all going on. We have prayer sessions uh, throughout the day, seven times, beginning at ten past four in the morning, and the last one is at uh, eight o'clock in the evening. And then Lords and Vespers kind of begin and end the work day. The whole idea is to sanctify the day, to be brought back again and again to worship and to God and to, to prayer. There's a rhythm to the day. It's pretty much the same every day, and yet every day is new. In between the prayer, we have work. We share the cleaning and the housework. We have four industries. We started the Eucharist Bread as a way of involving the elderly sisters and distribute this to parishes, monasteries, retreat houses throughout the country. We also manufacture Christmas cards and greeting cards and memorial cards, that's another industry. We run a farm and uh, we have a very small guest house where people can come and have some quiet and share with the community in the prayer. I didn't experience God's call until I was in my 40s. I lived a very comfortable life. I had a wide circle of friends and families and had a good social life. I worked in the central bank in Dublin. I had a, a good salary and good financial security. I suppose you could say I had everything that 
I wanted, but still there was this restlessness that needed to be filled, you know. <laughs> I wanted a more meaningful way of life. I was dissatisfied with the secularism and the individualism in our society, and God was excluded from everything I felt, you know. I took a career break and I went to Africa with the lay missionary uh, Via Torres Christi. I worked in South Africa in a children's home. And I think that really changed my my life. Laurie, you have a few more cars, I'm running out of them. There was a poster up about, I think, a monastic experience weekend or something. I followed it from there and I wrote to them and then I came here to the guest house and I just liked what I saw. You know, they were a very normal community and uh, I took it from there then. Altogether the farm is 220 acres, 40 of that's in woodland. There's about 80 acres tillage and 80 acres in grassland. The um, crops is all done by contractors. I don't know how far back, but there was a dairy herd on the farm, and there was a dairy herd up on the farm until six years ago, and we went into dry stock, beef cattle, and I was put onto the farm about four and a half years ago. So I continued that and would buy and sell cattle. And I enjoy it, you know, okay. working with animals and nature, sort of thing. Over the last number of years, there's been an effort, I think, in a lot of monasteries to move away from oil and use natural products to help the environment. So we planted the miscanthus. This purpose is to produce heat and uh, we have a large monastery and um, our oil bill is colossal, so the idea would hope that we would save money by uh, using it to heat the monastery. Now we're ready to install a miscanthus burning boiler. Somebody has to put in a, a bale of miscanthus every day with the tractor, and that'll be our heating. We hope with this that it will be more comfortable. Since I made my solemn profession just last year, I have been appointed the head of the Eucharist Bread Department. We only have two ingredients, which is a specialist altar bread flour and our own spring water. We humidify the bread, we cut it, and we make it in all sorts of sizes. So then we have sorting and packing and distribution. Because we make brown hose, it's unique in Ireland, so we get good sales for these, and there's good demand, so we're happy with that. In the last year, uh, two women have joined, so we're very delighted to have them. And there are a few people who are still uh, having a look and coming for weekends and discerning. And so we're hoping that more will come. One or two every second year is just fine. We'd like to keep the numbers up because you need a certain number to, to work well as a community. I'm doing vocation promotion work and vocation direction. We have a website and that would be my main way of promoting vocations. There is a tension between our internet presence and our, 
our commitment to monastic enclosure and, and monastic solitude. But I think it's important that we try to resolve that because when a young person is exploring and searching for a religious way of life, the first thing that they do is to go to the internet. So it's really important that we have an internet presence and that it's updated, that it's fresh, that it's alive, that they know we're awake, that we, that, and that they know we're human. So I was reading Buddhist books and Christian books. And then I saw an article in the Irish Times about Glen Cairn. But even then I didn't want to, I didn't think that I would enter. I hadn't an interest in entering or being a nun. I just wanted to see what monastic life was like in Ireland. So I came on a monastic experience weekend. Someone coming on a monastic experience weekend would be staying in our guest house. So it's a, an interesting experience of liturgical prayer uh, as it's lived out in a Cistercian monastery. It does take time to get used to the office. I remember my first time and I was bowing um, at the office and I was thinking, how many times have I been in this church today? It's quite overwhelming at first. I mean, I'm amused at one girl who came on the weekend who described it afterwards um, fondly as spiritual boot camp <laughs> because she couldn't get over uh, how many times we were we were in prayer and uh, and out of prayer and back in people find it hard to relate to entering an enclosure why would you why on earth would you in this day and age with so many other choices available to you but when you've discovered god I mean, a married couple would do the same if, if, if to be together, they would move to another continent. I came again for Easter, and that Easter is very beautiful here and very meaningful. Do you know, it was, that was a big experience for me. I remember thinking at that time that I would enter, but then well, once I left, that kind of urge went off me then, because you go back to life as normal and you think, nah, I wanted to have a little talk about community life. You know it's very important for us. So uh, you've been living it and you've both done so well. I came and stayed in the monastery. It was supposed to be for a month originally, but then I stayed for two months. After, but he talks about this. I still was very much sitting on the fence though, but there is a lot of fear comes with, you know, entering here and feeling that you're leaving your family behind or that, you know, so you have to kind of face those fears. So I was afraid, I suppose. We really need to have a good library. It's my pride and joy. I've been building it up for just over 30 years now. When I started, there were very few books really, but I was fortunate enough for a few years to be able to gather books together. And every space of wall now is covered with books. Lexio Divina is really essentially the study of scriptures, a slow meditative reading and reflection and study that leads to contemplation. We believe that the scriptures are inspired and through reading the word of God we come to know who God is and we come to know ourselves and we come to know how to live you're actually changed simply by reading and listening to the word. You know, you kind of get insight into yourself and insight into life and how God acts. So it's transformative actually, doing Lexio Divina. And it's also very nourishing as regards love. You know, you, you, once you know who God is, you, you want to love him because he's so good.
There will be no consolation. There will be echoes of the cry of Jesus, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, to be honest, I'm here because I felt in my late teens that God was calling me to religious life, and I didn't want it. I couldn't think of anything I wanted less. And I wanted freedom, I wanted to travel, I had a very good job for a while, but I just felt that the call was getting stronger and stronger. So I just came in. There was someone in my life, he was away and he rang and uh, my mother had to tell him. So uh, anyway, that's the way things happen sometimes. I, I thought that, you see, uh, if I told him and said too much about it, that I was afraid that I would be persuaded to continue to resist coming in and I knew that would be the wrong thing. I really would have been the wrong thing. It hasn't been a bed of roses. Everybody has difficulty in their lives. We all could go through bad patches, but I've no regrets whatever. The process is that you do six months as a postulant and then you have a month away. So the month out is really just it is to reflect and contemplate, but I suppose you've already really made the decision that you will come back. So I was at home for a month and saw a lot of family and did different things. Yeah, and then I was ready to come back then, yeah. <laughs> I never really wanted to go for the whole month. I only wanted, I thought a few days away would be grand. I was to have a cup of coffee somewhere, and a nice cappuccino or something, and then I'll come back. Okay. So Angela has spent six months as a postulant and uh, tomorrow is really a monastic initiation where she begins her two-year novitiate and she receives the novice's habit. You know, she's moving out of one way of life and into a new way of life, so it's a big, direct, a big change. Just take a bit of getting used to the, the change of clothes and the veil and to not feel self-conscious in it, you know, until it feels like you're, you've always worn them. <laughs> when I looked at myself in the mirror, it was, you know, it's strange to see yourself in robes. It's not something I ever thought I'd wear, so. I talked to my parents a week ago, and my dad was seemed a little bit emotional, I think, but no, they're very supportive. Tonight is Angela's last time walking outside the Abbey walls. Tomorrow she will ask to take the veil and go from postulant to novice, entering an enclosed order and committing to the discipline of Cistercian life. There's all sorts of challenges ahead, I suppose, about letting go, you know, letting go of the person that I was before, or the life that I had before, and you know the things that I probably won't do now. worries that I'll get very emotional and I'll cry a lot but I think actually it'll be okay I think actually I'll just be very happy yeah
It's 4 a.m. While the world sleeps, the nuns in Glencairn prepare to start their working day. Vigils is a liturgy of waiting for the coming of the Lord and the hope of a new day. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. You know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from sleep. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day. The seven hours, we call them the hours of the liturgy. The first one, vigil, so that's the waiting and keeping watch. There is a sense of God watching, watching over us, protecting us. Mostly, I think it is to be there in prayer for people. The thing that is really playing on your mind is the thing that wakes you up, usually about four o'clock in the morning. That's the time you can't sleep. That's when your worries have reached a point where you really can hardly face the next day. So that's why I'm on my feet in choir, praying for all the people that are suffering, whatever it is, that they will feel God's presence in that trauma. Come ring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks. With songs let us hail the Lord. Then we see the dawn coming, you know, and you're reminded that people are waiting for the dawn to come as well, people that are suffering. And we just pray that they'll experience God's loving care and protection, you know, during those hours. Angela Finnegan has travelled many roads through Buddhism, mindfulness and meditation to find a path to God. It has led her here to St Mary's Abbey, Glen Kern. Today she will ask the abbess to join Ireland's only Cistercian monastery for women. Angela, what do you ask? The mercy of God and of the Order. Rise in the name of the Lord. My dear Angela, today you take off the nice bright colours of pink and green that we have become accustomed to, and you were clothed in the white novice's habit. It seems to me, Angela, that you have always been a seeker of truth, going from your BA in science to an MA, then further studies in IT and social work, travelling, moving, looking, seeking for what might bring you fulfilment and satisfy your yearning heart. My prayer for you today, Angela, is that you will experience the tender embrace of God's love, that you will find peace and happiness in this community, and that the affection of all the sisters for you will soften the separation from your family and friends. So Angela, I ask you, are you ready to follow Christ along the path traced out by the gospel and by the holy rule? Yes, Reverend Mother, by the grace of God and with the assistance of your prayers. May the Lord bring to perfection the work he has begun in you. We, for our part, welcome you into our community as a novice.
Fiacre, for those who don't know, is the patron saint of gardeners. And I was fortunate enough to make a career of my hobby, which was growing things. Quite early on, I was put in charge of the garden. I would have been a disaster as a Carmelite because their enclosure is so much smaller. But here we have 200 acres. And for me, that was so important because I've lived the greater part of my life outdoors. Somehow, when you're involved in a family business, as I was because we were running a garden centre, there just wasn't time. There wasn't time for God, you know. And it was only much later on when I quietened down, started to really listen. It was 2006. I came on a Tuesday. I was here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I've never prayed so hard, read so much. I was so busy trying to make it happen that by Sunday I was all worn out. And I remember going into the church and sitting down and giving, issuing God with an ultimatum. Okay, you got me here, and now I just feel it's all a complete waste of time. So either you do something or I'm off. It was the most glorious morning. And as we walked along the path down by the river, this salmon jumped in the most perfect arc and the sunlight reflected on his speckles. And I was just rooted to the spot. I mean, God in his magnificence. I'm uh, 27 years here now, I think, 27, yeah. I don't think of it as chalking up one year after another. Once you come here, that's the kind of it, you know, you lose a lot of track of time, years-wise, you know. I'm in charge of maintenance, just ordinary plumbing things then, washers and taps, plugs on, <laughs> fixed plugs or that on, on electrical equipment. The general small maintenance things I try and, and manage myself, but I know my limits, so anything over and above me, I have to get in somebody to do it. Yeah, sometimes you can get carried away with the work, but the office gives us reminders of, you know, that we are here as a, a prayer community, really, you know. I could be, you know, outside doing <laughs> maybe more beneficial work, other, you know, but um, it's not the actual work I do here. It's my motivation for doing it. You know, it's all in service of the community, which in, in the end result really is in service of, of God, really, my relationship with God. Sorry for disturbing you. It is a busy life and people mightn't realise that. Our life is very conditioned with bells and times and being punctual and that kind of thing. The Hermitage would be a way of getting in, in touch with your own interior spiritual journey. Each sister every month can take a day off, normally to either go apart and spend the time alone. It's an opportunity to deepen your own prayer life as well. Benedict even himself lived as a hermit for some time. All the early Irish saints too at some stage lived as hermits. Like it was always there and even in more recent times you had Thomas Merton lived as a hermit. I just like to get away myself and be alone.
In spite of great efforts to attend to maintenance over the years, the building has deteriorated quite, quite a lot and we need to put a lot of work into it. Mostly it's really updating. We need to look at fire safety, damp. We have rising damp everywhere. We probably have wet rot and dry rot. We need a completely new water system. We need a new electricity system. Some of the stairs are shaky. The house needs repair. Parts of it are 300 years old. So um, we need an awful lot of work done in that. But there are different views about how to go about it naturally. What are those two little squares? Are they windows? They're from windows, above? skylights. Oh, from above. Yeah, yeah. there's skylights on the top of this as well. Oh and no, they can't be, Shrevan. You've got another floor above that. I know, yeah, but they're having um, glass in the glass floor. In the floor. Oh, well, that's the very down. nifty. Mm -hmm. Well, since 2008, we've been working with an architect and a design team. We did get planning permission, but then we didn't have the funds, sufficient funds to start. Or the other option then would be to try and reduce the size of the bedrooms and put in another one. Oh, I don't think that would be feasible. At the moment, we're concentrating on fundraising. People have been most generous and we're so appreciative. We're a big community, we have lots of contacts, everybody's making an effort, and um, it's coming on. Right, okay, okay. Nice to see you, Mary. Okay. We have a very good relationship with the local community. Hello, Sister Michelle, how are you? Good, Mary. So many people come to the front door and ask for prayers for particular intentions. So many people email and phone. And as well as that, sister, I would like you to put on the prayer list somebody who is very ill. Yes. There is a power that comes and there is a healing and there is um, grace that comes through intercessory prayer. And thank you, you too. Bye bye now. We have a very small guest house where people can come and have some quiet and share with the community in the prayer. The receiving of guests is a very big thing in the Cistercian life and uh, the rule will always say that the porter or portress should always be near ready to open the door and welcome a person you know so the whole thing of hospitality is terribly important. You get uh, all kinds of different visitors really yeah it's amazing I mean we wouldn't know a lot of most of the people who just come they phone up, you know, can they come and spend a week? Then there are regular people that come back every year to make their retreat, some like a private retreat themselves, and they'd come here for it, and they join us in the liturgy, and then they go the walks, there's plenty of walks for them, and they enjoy that, you know. We're lucky with the surroundings we have, you see, it's very congenial, yeah. We had three deaths this year. As the community ages, yes, we can expect one a year, but three is quite a lot. And it does impact on the community. We have to go through our period of bereavement, you know, diminishing numbers, and we lose lovely people uh, with great gifts, and you'd love to keep them forever. So we have to adjust to their absence, and we miss them. Missing Claire enormously. She was such a beautiful person. The of the Lord. But it's the culmination of a life dedicated to God. God is what it's all about and getting closer to Him. She didn't have to suffer. Like she, there she was, 96 on her feet, answering the phone every day. Like she had a lovely life. 
And while it was desperately sad that they all ended so quick, still she was saved a lot of suffering. She was saved a lot of suffering, you know. She deserved it. <laughs> she was gorgeous. She was gorgeous. St. Benedict says, be peacemakers, be peaceable, be patient and compassionate. And if we do fail, as we do each day, that we never despair of God's mercy. Benedict says that we are free to make known our point of view or our opinion, but at the right time and in the right way, in a humble way, and to do that is very, very difficult sometimes. You might be bursting to make it known, you know, how you feel or what you want to do, what your agenda is, etc. But uh, our spiritual guide in St. Benedict is saying, no, you have to wait. Um, and in that time, when you're waiting for that right appropriate moment, if you've managed to get that far, <laughs> maybe something like wisdom descends and your senses calm down and you start to be more open to God's will in the situation and not your own. As I have often said to people, if I was to pick 30 or 32 women to live with, I wouldn't pick the 30 or 32 that are here. But this is where God has planted me. I take it in faith that this is where he wants me to be moulded and, you know, and then there's strength in, in the community as well, like uh, living in a community means, you know, everything can be shared out, like every one person doesn't have to take all the responsibility of all that's going on. Maybe people tend to dismiss enclosed life and say, oh, I couldn't possibly do it, I, I couldn't imagine it. But it's important to bear in mind that built into the structures there is a significant amount of silence and solitude so that there's a healthy balance where I can breathe. I ran in the Dublin City Marathon in, oh, I think it's 1980. And uh, I sometimes feel that this life is like a, like a marathon, you know, rather than a sprint. You meet the wall and you have good days and bad days. And it's a struggle, you know, and uh, every day is a struggle, but I say to myself when I get up in the morning, today I begin again. Apparently I'm in the honeymoon period now. I mean, there's been a lot of challenges, yeah, but I have a real sense of peace actually and contentedness and joy quite a lot of the time actually. <laughs> and I never would have thought that, do you know, that I would be able to say that. You know, you've quite a lot of solitude here, so you have time to to work things out internally and to kind of see the truth behind things. Now I feel I'm more myself. Who God intended me to be, I suppose. We had a lovely autumn and winter. 
then January come in with heavy rain. The cattle haven't got out to the grass yet either. This week is really the only first dry weather we've had. And then we had an unmerciful gale or storm or whatever you call it. Was it Darwin they called it in around the middle of February? And I had the cattle fed and just was going up round the corner. The next thing, this unmerciful roar. It was like a volcano <laughs> noise, you know. Just fell right behind me. I was lucky it didn't fall on top of me. So it was frightening. We were about 15 or 16 trees down with the storm, which is, we've never had done like that before. And then we had a death. We had sister, poor sister Frances. So unexpected, it was another shock. She died very suddenly. Then my lambs give us a bit of life to the place. The first mother here with the twins that's hopping around there, they were born Sunday afternoon. There were 16 more to lamb now with it all safe birth. But one ewe developed complications. The abbess, a former nurse, came to help. Head now, Piss. She's not ready yet. She's she all, never, no. Come she on, Piss. She never bothered pressing her. Come on, old Piss, and push out. I'm expecting a man to come to give us a hand. If he comes into the yard, stop him there and get him in here. I can't get the feet, but I can get the head. I see the feet's maybe caught. That's what worried me about her. Push out, girlie. Come on, come on, push out. Oh, God, is he alive? Come on, Piss. Live. Well done, Life. Come on, little lamb. Don't die now after all. Come on, pet. Oh, oh, come ah, on, little, yeah. little boy. We have a voice anyway. <laughs> St. Benedict says that, you know, you live Lent in a joyful manner. No, a boy in the gallery. In fact, the meaning of Lent is springtime, so it's a time of growth, new life, and always with the focus on Easter, the joy of Easter, the resurrection, it's a wonderful event. community is a school of love. So we learn how to love God and how to love each other and how to love ourselves. It's very beautiful really to know the richness of community life and all the different gifts that there are and you really start to become kind of more of a, a we rather than an I. It's a warm, caring, tolerant community. And I've lived here for 50 years, and I can say that you know, truthfully, you know. I, I, it's a happy place, Blenkiron. Our primary focus, I think myself, is really seeking God, coming to know who God is, who we are, how we are in relationship. And that automatically brings an energy into the world. It's the energy of good and the energy of grace, and it does touch everyone.